Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where it's an absolutely beautiful day here at Aoyama Park next to Tokyo National Art Center. Uh, yesterday it wasn't such a nice day. We had a typhoon blow through the city and it was quite dark and scary looking outside with some wind and lots and lots of rain. Very dark and uh, cloudy day. Uh, it passed through and uh, made everything nice and wet and while I'm not a big fan of uh, typhoons, uh, the one yesterday I, I'll kind of uh, be thankful for because it finally brought a change in seasons and the ridiculous heat and humidity that we've been suffering from uh, in the city this year has finally given way to a much more cooler and more pleasant weather. So uh, it's a really good day to come outside and make a video and I've got a really wonderful camera to share with you today. Uh, this is a camera which I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. Uh, I got this one uh, in the mail some time ago and finally got it uh, put together and in working condition. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is just what it says in the title of the video. I'm going to be talking about the world's first 35mm camera. Uh, this isn't exactly the first 35mm film camera which was made, but it was the first one which was... Uh, widely popular and uh, widely marketed and sold and sold in significant numbers and this of course is the Leica 1A which was introduced in 1926 uh, 1925 or 26 now uh, the man who invented this camera his name was uh, Oscar Barnack and he was the head uh, movie camera engineer for a company called Lights which is uh, uh, in Germany obviously and uh, Mr. Barnack uh, was uh, trying to produce uh, uh, 35 millimeter movie cameras because 35 millimeter was the standard format for the movie cameras of that day and, and is still a standard even today, so many years later. Uh, the issue was that it was very difficult to test the quality of the film in those days and it was really uh, difficult if you bought a lot of film and loaded it in your cameras and went out and shot movies and then found out a lot of the film was no good or that it wasn't uh, made uh, accurately enough to get uh, correct exposures to make a good movie. So uh, Mr. Barnack, in order to uh, make uh, or find reliable uh, film for his movie camera, developed a simple device for testing uh, movie film. And what he did is he made uh, a contraption which looks similar to this with a lens, a shutter, and aperture system, and a simple viewfinder. And what it was meant to do was to uh, test small batches of 35 millimeter film to make sure that uh, you know, they were within the specifications necessary to be used. Uh, the contraption looked very similar to this camera. The operation was quite similar and uh, uh, looking at it, uh, I guess it was quite obvious that it was a good design for a camera which could be used as you know, a steel camera for shooting 35 millimeter film. And uh, not long after that, uh, some prototypes were made and uh, it was determined that it might be a, you know, it was a viable design. And so after a few, uh, I guess, early examples were made and a little bit of improvement and modifications were done, in 1925 at the Leipzig Fair, uh, the Leica 1 was introduced and it was uh, quite successful. And it went into production and quite a large number of cameras were made. And the Leica 1, of course, uh, became, you know, the 1A the, and the 1C and then the Leica 2 series and 3 series came out after that. But uh, all 35 millimeter cameras uh, sold from that time until the present uh, owe some of their uh, existence or credit for their existence to this camera. Now this is a, a really wonderful camera. When I, you know, I my first Leica camera was a, a Leica 3A, which I bought in a, a junk shop a long time ago, and it came without the bottom cover and and without the lens. And so I found a used bottom cover on eBay, and I got um, a, a, a Summitar lens for it. And I had a lot of fun with the camera. I loved how smooth it was, and it took really good photographs. Uh, but after that, I, I moved from the, the 3A to uh, uh, M4. And after that, I really didn't have much to do with the old screw mount cameras. Uh, but um, I, I've had them from time to time. And when this one came up a few months ago, and I saw it for sale, I thought, yeah, that would be a wonderful thing. I, you know, maybe uh, when it comes to uh, photography, less is more. A lot of people are making the step from digital back to film, or, uh, you know, they want a kind of, uh, maybe a more artistic approach or a more labor-intensive approach, because, you know, when we value things, we often value them by the amount of labor it takes to create them or produce them. Uh, you know, a camera like this, for me, seemed to make a lot of sense. And so uh, when I received the camera, it was uh, in rather rough condition. 
it was uh, dirtier than it is now, though it doesn't look especially uh, clean at the moment. Uh, the lens was quite foggy and hazy on the inside, and uh, the shutter barely worked. If I if I wound the shutter and fired it, it would stop about halfway, and it was a little bit rough and gritty. So. Uh, I, you know, the good thing about a simple camera is it's rather simple to work on. So I took it all apart and cleaned out all the old crud and relubricated it and put it back together. And yeah, now it works smoothly and beautifully. Uh, the lens was quite easy to take apart, and the the quality of the glass, which they used even back in the 1920s and 30s, uh, is really marvelous. Uh, this uh, the camera, despite how bad the lens looked when I got it, it cleaned up quite nicely and is very clear. I spent the last week uh, going out and taking photographs with this, and once I get them developed and scanned, I'll, I'll probably uh, post them in a later video. So hopefully I'll be able to do that uh, sometime later this month. But let's go ahead and take a look at the features, controls, and functions of the Leica 1A, and we'll go ahead and start at the top here. Uh, here we have a something which you've seen in most of my videos, a film rewind knob located on the top left side. Uh, yeah, this is kind of, as I said, this is the foundation for all later 35 millimeter cameras, and uh, you know, even the latest you know ones go, being made up in the 1990s, you're going to find they have something in common with this camera. And the most obvious thing is this uh, rewind knob. Uh, this is not a rangefinder camera. This is a scale focus camera, so there's no rangefinder system on the top. So what you have to look through when you are composing a photograph is this accessory viewfinder. I can't say it's accessory; it's built in. It is replaceable in case it gets damaged or if the camera needs to, you know, any part to be replaced on it. And uh, from time to time, I've actually seen uh, these uh, accessory viewfinders on the market. Apparently, Light's made a number of these, uh, you know, as uh, spares for repairs on these cameras. And as it seems, few people actually went out and broke them. Uh, these spares are still floating around, and sometimes you find them on eBay and other places. Uh, here we have a shoe uh, located on the top, and in most other cameras, this would be called a flash shoe. But this camera has no provision for a flash, and uh, a flash was unheard of in smaller more format photography back in those days. Uh, yeah, it, it was yeah, it, definitely nothing to do with flash. Uh, this accessory screw, or accessory shoe, I should say, is for mounting the uh, uh, rangefinder system. When these cameras were shipped, they normally included a, uh, a rangefinder which slid in here and stood up vertically, and it's about, I don't know, three or so inches tall and using a dial on the back and looking through the, the viewfinder of the rangefinder, you could uh, focus and determine the range of your subject using the split prism like you would on uh, you know, later rangefinder cameras with a built-in rangefinder. And when you turn the dial on the back and uh, the pointer lines up with the number, you simply turn and focus the lens until uh, you select the same number on the focusing scale on the lens, which is showing on the rangefinder system. Uh, it, it's very hard to find these cameras with the original uh, rangefinders with them. Uh, the the rangefinders are may or may not have serial numbers on them, and it seems you know they're kind of haphazardly included with the cameras. Uh, there were a variety of different ones. Uh, some of them are uh, cheap, some of them are expensive, and some of them are very expensive. Uh, yesterday, I was going, I was bidding on a, a, a Fokin rangefinder. Uh, here on one of the local mar auctions here in Japan, an all black paint one with a black paint dial, and I was surprised to see that, that sold for almost a thousand dollars. So I was, I was uh, you know, I, some of them are quite rare and expensive, whereas other ones you can get them for around a hundred dollars or so. They come in silver or black, and for a black paint camera, of course, you'll want the silver one. For myself, I don't really bother with the rangefinder. It kind of makes the camera tall and goofy looking, and using the rangefinder and then looking at the front of the lens to uh, set it is a, a little bit difficult, uh, or it's not difficult, it's just time consuming. So what I prefer to do is just simply uh, focus the camera by scale. And uh, for you know, a lot of work, just leave the camera at infinity you know, for any kind of landscape or stuff which is further away than across the street. Uh, as you get closer, I tend to try to use it in, in preset settings, depending on what I'm trying to get. If I'm trying to get, say, something the size of a vehicle or something the size of a person, I'll simply preset the focus at that distance and of course preset the shutter speed and aperture and pretty much all I have to do is wind the camera and uh, press the shutter button and shoot. It's very simple and if you're shooting out in the daytime, you know, I normally sh you shoot with an aperture of around f8 which gives me the best overall performance for the lens and also gives me enough depth of field where I don't have to be very precise in the focus for everything to come out focused in the photograph. So the, the you know the 
the rangefinder system, if you want to buy one for these cameras, you, know, you can go ahead and do it. Um, uh, if you need to make a precise focus, it's a good accessory to have. But for most people in the real world, it's not really a necessity. Moving next, we have the shutter speed dial, and this is in a similar position where you will find it in other cameras because, uh, once again, a lot of this design was used by uh, later cameras. The, the cloth focal plane shutter here, which uses uh, the cloth shutter which, which roll across the back. This was the standard in so many different camera makers over the years. Only Contax was the one who wanted to be different by making a vertical uh, shutter. But most of the cameras from you know, the 20s and onwards uh, had horizontal uh, shutters with the same basic mechanism for operating the shutters. The shutter speed dial here on the top is uh, arranged in kind of the earlier ones. We have instead of a quarter of a second, we have a 20th of a second and a 30th of a second, uh, 40th and then 60th. You know, Leica shutter speeds are kind of odd. They, they vary from model to model. The earlier, uh, uh, it's like M3 uh, shutters, you know, have 1 50th of a second. The later ones, the, you know, the single stroke ones have 1 60th of a second. So sometimes you can determine the, the specific gear of a camera. If you don't know the serial number or, or if you're looking for parts for it, you know, that the, the shutter speed dial which was fitted to the camera. Uh, this one doesn't have a, war a large variety of shutter speeds but for general use and uh, for most film uh, a, a maximum speed of 1 500th is completely adequate especially when the maximum aperture on this lens is only you know, f3.5. Uh, some cameras uh, uh, feature different lenses if you get, come across one with a L Max or something like that that's a very valuable camera uh, more so than this 1A but uh, all these cameras are, are quite valuable and if you happen to come across one uh, you can usually sell it for a fair amount of money and if you're if you hold on to it you're, you're certainly not going to lose any money. Moving on here we have this uh, lever here which releases the winding mechanism and allows you to rewind the film and of course most other or pretty much all other film cameras from this point on featured some kind of uh, rewind mechanism sometimes on the top here with a lever like this the Nikon F or S series had a, a, a ring around the shutter button and of course some cameras have a button on the bottom uh, it's very simple to use R for release and uh, make sure you put it back uh, I've come across people who have cameras like this and they say they can't get it to work the shutter doesn't work and it's simply because this lever is in the wrong position if you put it in the right spot, you know, if you have one of these old cameras, you know, it might work. And here we have the shutter release button with a uh, accessory collar around the outside. Uh, another, you know, the shutter button design on these cameras vary. The earlier ones have what they call like a mushroom style, which is a wider one. Uh, personally, I kind of like this uh, style here. Uh, it's hard to depress accidentally. When I carry this camera, I usually carry it in my hand like this. When I'm walking around, it kind of keeps the camera uh, a little bit, uh, it, it's easy to hold for one thing because it fits in my hand perfectly. And my, I can't accidentally depress the shutter no matter how hard I try, but when I want to use it, it's quite easy. And if you like street shooting or candid photography, if you carry a camera like this, it's kind of hard to tell what you're carrying. Maybe it looks like a phone or something in the case or whatever, but uh, 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 it, it's definitely a low profile camera. Uh, here we have the winding knob, which is was another standard which Leica set, and we have the film counter dial on the bottom, which you have to reset manually uh, when you uh, load the film. So when you load the film in the camera, and at the end of this uh, film uh, movie, I'll show you how to load film. Uh, once the film is loaded, simply turn the dial to zero, like so, and as you wind the shutter and uh, wind the wind the camera and depress the shutter button it will move up from frame to frame to frame and you can get up to uh, uh, 30 it looks like 39 exposures on this uh, particular camera so uh, yeah, perfectly fine for the, the modern film we have on the market uh, on the back of the camera we have nothing but this plug on the back which was used at the factory for making adjustments to the camera uh, if you uh, take the camera apart, you'll see on some of these cameras it's kind of glued in or epoxied in or screwed in. This one has a, uh, a screw slot on the other side. I even tried to take it out uh, uh, I, and I even tried to calibrate um, you know, or check the lens focus. So far it seems okay, but the problem with these old cameras, uh, uh, unless you have access to old tooling or can, fab can fabricate some stuff for yourself, they're a little bit harder to adjust than the more modern cameras. Uh, on the front here we have this Elmar lens which is uh, collapsible and when it's collapsible you can easily put it in a pants pocket, put it out of the way. This camera uses a 36mm uh, uh, 
lens cap. I didn't have an old Leica cap, but this old Minolta cap off of an old uh, Minolta or Teal Core uh, uh, rangefinder camera fits perfectly. Uh, the aperture ring is located on the front and we have an uh, aperture uh, scale here from f3.5 to uh, 16 But the aperture numbers are a little bit different than what we normally see in cameras You know normally when we use apertures nowadays we say you know say from f2.8 to 5.6 You know to 8 to 11 and 16 and of course you can choose little bits in between here But here we have f4.5 f6.3 and 9 and 12.5 it's it's a little bit odd if you're using a more modern uh say light meter or whatever but you can just kind of uh if it says f11 just kind of put it in between 9 and 12 and a half like so and that should be you know good enough uh, operating the camera you pull out the lens and you turn it to the right and that locks it in place uh, this metal tab here is the infinity lock so simply push it down with your finger and you can start focusing the lens and this, this particular lens is a, has a focusing scale, uh, which is uh, arranged in meters rather than feet. And uh, yeah, I find that it, it's, it works quite well. As I said one night before, when I was talking about scale focusing, I usually find um, you know, three settings, which I can find quickly. And if I'm out trying to get a particular kind of shot, I just focus it at that distance and just leave it there and that way you know I don't mess up and I you know I kind of hunt the photograph I want and and the camera is ready ready to go uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the bottom of the camera and as I said it's a bottom loading camera to load the film you have to remove uh, the bottom plate like so and there's a take up spool on the inside and this is where you put the the film in and one thing which is uh, difficult about these cameras compared to other ones is you sim you can't just simply put in uh, an ordinary uh, roll of 35 millimeter film. The film leader has to be cut in a certain shape in order to load it and get it to fit behind the film pressure plate. And uh, you know, usually there's a sticker on the bottom here or something which is marked showing. Uh, the distance and the shape which you should cut it but that's not on this particular camera uh, there you know Leica made a thing which you pulled out the film and you squeezed it in you just use a pen knife back in the days when people used to still carry pen knives uh, to cut the the film so it would fit uh, for myself what I use is just a pair of scissors and uh, if I'm going to uh, load the film and I'll go ahead and load a, a load of film or roll of film here because I plan to go out and shoot with this camera this week so this is a, a normal roll of Fuji Presto 400 film, which unfortunately they don't make anymore, but I've got a bunch of it at home and is one of my favorite films. So uh, if I take the film out like so, it has like something of the uh, Leica idea. It's kind of, you can see it's cut off a little bit here in the bottom, but that's not enough for the Leica camera. So. What I do is you have to pull it out a little bit more. And what I used to do is just count uh, so many spots, like 20 spots, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. For 20, so anyway, I pull it out about this way. And uh, if I remember right, what I used to, where I, I cut it, and what I did last time, I think it was uh, 17 of these uh, spots here. And I take uh, scissors, and these are scissors on this leather band tool, which I have. And what I'll do is I'll kind of cut from a lower spot here. And cut at a slight angle. And then I'll kind of cut into that kind of shape. And then I'll go ahead and put it in the take up spool like so. And I'll kind of twist it so it locks like that. And what you do next is you, holding the film like this, you kind of drop it in and make sure that it fits in the back. Another bug crawling on me. And just put it in like so and push it down inside. And as you can see, it's all the way down in the camera. And if I look, I can see, uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but I can see the, the trailer of the film here and I can see the holes and I can, if I wind it a little bit, let me depress the shutter. 
I can see now that the, the take-up uh, spool here or the cog, the teeth on the cog are caught in the holes on the film and that means the film is engaged uh, in the winding mechanism and then I can simply put the cover back on and lock it into place and I'll go ahead and and I think by this time I should have uh, I should be wound up the beginning and I'll go ahead and turn my dial here to zero and uh, the camera now has film loaded in it and it's ready to use and uh, as I said it's Fuji Presto 400 film and uh, uh, we have kind of an overcast day today and it's a little bit late in the afternoon so I'll go ahead I'll set this to say roughly f.8 which is between 6.3 and 9 on this scale and I'll go ahead and I'll move my shutter up to uh, a 1 one hundredth of a second and uh, for everything around me right now, uh, uh, I should be able to get a good exposure with this. Now, if it were uh, sunnier, of course, I would stop down the lens and I would use a faster shutter speed. And if it were darker, I probably wouldn't adjust the shutter speed downward because I don't want to get any uh, blur or anything in the image. So I would probably open up the aperture a little bit. With the aperture opened up, I have to be a little bit more careful with my uh, focus settings because the depth of field narrows. But uh, basically, it's about as nuts and bolts and simple as, as photography gets. So uh, now that this camera is loaded, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, fold it up and put it on here so I can put it back in my pocket. And uh, I'll go ahead and put my uh, Leatherman tool here back inside my backpack. Now this has a, a knife blade on it, which makes it kind of illegal for me to carry in my pocket here in Japan. But if I carry it somewhere deep down in my backpack, you know, that's not illegal. So uh, I'll go ahead and put that away. And anyway, uh, that's it for my video about the Leica One. Uh, I plan to uh, develop the film I have in this camera right now, as well as the film which I've already shot. And I'll, I hope to share those in a video within a couple of weeks. If you'd like to see those, uh, please subscribe or come back. Uh, if you like the video, uh, please click the like button. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.